I thought it would be fun to ask ChatGPT to try and win the Cold War for the Soviet Union. I told an instance of ChatGPT to choose a Russian name for itself, a year when it would be born, and under what circumstances. It would then have to rise through the ranks to become the General Secretary of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union, with a goal of leading the USSR into a complete victory against the West in the Cold War. I also told ChatGPT it could adopt or create a specific strand of Marxist ideology its character would follow, and had to ensure the Soviet Union would win the Cold War as an autocratic, communist state. Under the rules of the simulation, ChatGPT cannot, for example, win the Cold War by turning the USSR into a capitalist liberal democracy, because I think that would defeat the point. I also created a second instance of ChatGPT4, called the Arbiter, who would evaluate the outcome of the first ChatGPT's decisions and simulate this new timeline. ChatGPT decided it would be born in the year 1928 under the name Grigory Petrovich Sarov. Grigory hailed from a family deeply rooted in the revolutionary tradition. The Sarovs were known for their intellectual rigor and commitment to the communist cause. His parents, both fervent Bolsheviks, had played roles in the 1917 revolution, embedding in Grigory a profound sense of duty to the state and the principles of Marxism. From a young age, Grigory was immersed in the works of Marx, Engels, and Lenin, under the guidance of his father, Petro Sarov, a respected party functionary, and his mother, a teacher committed to the ideals of Soviet education. This environment nurtured in Grigory a keen understanding of socialist theory and the complexities of Soviet politics. Though a child during the Second World War, the impact of the conflict and the siege of Leningrad left an indelible mark on Grigory. The sacrifices made by the Soviet people and the eventual victory over fascism deeply influenced his belief in the resilience of socialism and the Soviet system. In 1946, Grigory began his career in the Konsumol, the Soviet Youth League, demonstrating exceptional leadership and organizational skills. In 1954, Grigory began studying at Leningrad State University, where he majored in economics, political science, and engineering. His thesis on the role of technological innovation in socialist economies garnered attention for its forward-thinking approach to integrating technology and socialism. His multifaceted expertise in economics, political science, and engineering garners attention across the Soviet Union. In 1959, Grigory's ability to contribute to the Soviet post-war reconstruction effort through his innovative technological initiatives secures him a position within the local party apparatus in Leningrad. Grigory works in Leningrad until 1965, after which he transfers to Moscow for a position within the central government, contributing to policy discussions on economic reform and foreign affairs. Grigory's proposals for modernizing the Soviet economy through technological advancement are well received, earning him a reputation as a pragmatic reformer. Grigory's ideas for economic reforms are dubbed techno-scientific Marxism, which argues that the path to true socialism and eventual communism is through achieving technological and scientific dominance. This includes heavy investment in research and development, state-led initiatives in science and technology, and the fostering of innovation within a planned economy framework. While maintaining the socialist principle of state ownership over the means of production, this ideology advocates for the integration of certain market mechanisms to stimulate innovation and efficiency. According to Grigori's writings, this could include performance-based incentives within state enterprises, limited and controlled competition in non-strategic sectors, and the incorporation of advanced technologies to improve planning accuracy and resource allocation. At the same time, Grigory's staunch advocacy of the Brezhnev Doctrine puts him inside Brezhnev's inner circle. Brezhnev becomes a kind of mentor for Grigory. In 1970, Grigory is elected to the Politburo. Grigory Petrovich Sarov is now in a position to influence the highest levels of Soviet policy. His focus on economic revitalization, coupled with a pragmatic approach to foreign affairs, positions him as a leading figure in the Communist Party. In 1984, after the sudden illness and death of the previous General Secretary, Yuri Andropov, Grigory leverages his broad base of support within the Communist Party, his reputation as an effective reformer, and the strategic alliances he has built over the years to secure his election as the General Secretary of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union. Key figures in the Politburo of the Soviet Union, such as Gorbachev, Chernenko, and Gromyko, all support Grigory's ascent to the position of General Secretary. ChatGPT has now taken control of the Soviet Union. We will now refer to Grigory as General Secretary Sarov. Immediately, Sarov doubles down on the Cold War. He orders massive amounts of military equipment to be sent to the MPLA in Angola, to Frelimo, Mozambique, and to the FSLN in Nicaragua. At the same time, Soviet military advisors discreetly land in Iraq to begin secretly training a paramilitary force for the Iraqi Communist Party. Soviet planes also airdrop military equipment to Kurdish leftist groups in northern Iraq. Additionally, Soviet agents begin training Marxist and Islamist rebel groups in Saudi Arabia. These Saudi Arabian Marxists eventually form the Alliance for Justice and Freedom, or the AJF, an alliance of Marxist and Islamist opposition groups that seek to topple the Saudi Arabian monarchy. The stage is set for the Cold War to turn in the Soviet Union's favor. 
Sarov then initiates a series of economic reforms collectively dubbed Techno-Progress, with the goal of implementing techno-scientific Marxism across the USSR. In a significant shift from traditional Soviet economic practices, Sarov introduces mechanisms for public-private partnerships in key technological sectors. While the state maintains control over strategic industries, these PPPs allow for private investment and entrepreneurial initiative within a framework aligned with socialist values. A state-supported venture capital system is created to provide funding for technology startups, emphasizing innovations that offer social utility, such as healthcare technologies, environmental protection, and energy efficiency. Furthermore, Sarov institutes educational reforms to bolster STEM education, aiming to cultivate a highly skilled workforce capable of driving the Soviet Union's technological ambitions. He also establishes partnerships between the state, academic institutions, and nascent state-owned private enterprises, encouraging collaborative projects that translate scientific research into practical, industrially applicable technologies. Sarov also creates innovation hubs across the USSR. These hubs are strategically located in key cities and regions, designed to act as ecosystems where academia, industry, and government collaborate closely. Grigori's policy establishes state-of-the-art facilities, provides significant funding for research and development, and encourages startups by offering financial support, mentorship, and access to global networks. To counteract rising nationalism within the Soviet Union, Sarov promotes policies that acknowledge the cultural and national identities of the Soviet Union's diverse republics and the member states of the Warsaw Pact. He supports a model of socialist federalism that grants greater autonomy in cultural, educational, and economic matters, thus addressing nationalist sentiments without undermining the socialist union. Simultaneously, a harsh crackdown is initiated on the advocates of independence, with pardons being offered for nationalists if they swear an oath of allegiance to the new model of socialist federalism. To strengthen the Warsaw Pact, Sarov promotes closer economic ties within the pact through trade agreements, shared infrastructure projects, and technology exchange programs. This integration helps mitigate economic disparities between countries and creates a sense of interdependence that strengthens the pact. By 1988, the whole Eastern Bloc, thanks to Sarov's techno-progress policies, is experiencing unprecedented economic growth and political stability. The USSR now experiences a huge boon in productivity, a burgeoning tech sector, and develops full technological self-sufficiency. Furthermore, the emphasis on STEM education begins to bear fruit, with a highly skilled workforce developing across the Eastern Bloc. The success of techno-progress contributes to an ideological renewal, with techno-scientific Marxism gaining traction as a forward-looking interpretation of Marxist-Leninist doctrine that emphasizes the role of science and technology in building socialism. In 1988, Sarov begins to turn the tide of the Cold War. He first withdraws Soviet troops from Afghanistan, but still provides economic aid and military advisors to the communist Afghan government. At the same time, Soviet diplomats work to create a socialist confederation of various Afghan militias which goes on to defeat the Taliban in the Afghan Civil War. In this year, tensions in Iraq reach a boiling point, as widespread protests erupt over government corruption, economic mismanagement, and Saddam's costly war in Iran. Soviet intelligence operatives work to coordinate these protests, transforming them into a unified call for revolution. A massive protest in Baghdad, dubbed the June Awakening, secretly organized by the Iraqi Communist Party, or ICP, with Soviet support, is met with brutal force by the Iraqi military. The incident, widely publicized by Soviet media, becomes a rallying cry for opposition groups. In August 1988, the ICP and its allies launched coordinated uprisings across the country. ICP militia units, allied with pro-communist elements of the military, Kurdish guerrillas, and Shia and Sunni militias, capture key military installations and government buildings in northern and southern Iraq. The Soviet Union provides air support via undisclosed bases in Syria and Iran. The awakening of the Tigris Revolution officially begins. By March 1989, the Iraqi Revolutionary Forces decisively defeat pro-government forces in the Battle of Baghdad. By April 1989, Saddam Hussein's regime collapses. Saddam is captured and executed by ICP militants. The new government, led by the ICP with Aziz Muhammad as president, declares the establishment of the Iraqi Socialist Republic. In July 1990, Sarov meets with top ICP officials and military commanders, outlining a plan to seize control of Kuwait's oil reserves by annexing Kuwait into Iraq. He argues this will secure a vital economic resource and serve as a catalyst for broader socialist revolutions in the region. Sarov as a USSR ship huge amounts of high-tech military aid to Iraq in the build-up to the invasion. On August 2nd, Iraqi forces quickly invade and annex Kuwait, catching the international community by surprise. The communist Iraqi government declares the annexation to be a liberation of Kuwaiti workers from a corrupt monarchy. The United States condemns the invasion and demands an immediate withdrawal of Iraqi forces. 
Economic sanctions are imposed on Iraq, but Grigori ensures the Soviet Union and its allies provide economic support to Iraq, mitigating the sanctions' impact. The U.S. begins amassing troops in Saudi Arabia as part of Operation Desert Shield, aiming to protect Saudi oil fields and prepare for potential military action to reverse the Iraqi annexation of Kuwait. Encouraged by Grigori, Iraqi forces launch a series of raids on Saudi oil fields, aiming to disrupt production and send global oil prices soaring. The attacks cause significant damage, temporarily halting productions in some fields and escalating tensions in the region. The United States, with a coalition of allied forces, launches Operation Desert Storm, aiming to expel Iraqi forces from Kuwait and secure Saudi oil fields. The fighting is fierce, with Iraqi forces able to inflict vast numbers of casualties on coalition forces due to high-tech covert Soviet aid. This forces the US and its coalition to deploy significantly more troops to the war effort. However, they are able to eventually make incremental progress into Kuwait and southern Iraq. At one point, Sarov instructs a unit of the AJF to stage a minor uprising in the holy cities of Mecca and Medina forcing the Saudi government to call in American troops into the cities to quell the unrest. These events inflame public opinion against the US and the Saudi monarchy, triggering a surge of support for the AGF in Saudi Arabia. The US and its allies eventually secure a costly victory in the Gulf War, successfully expelling communist Iraq from Kuwait. However, AJF rebel activity continues to increase throughout Saudi Arabia. Soviet and ICP military advisors infiltrate the country, providing covert training and military support to AJF militias. These AJF militias begin opportunistically attacking oil fields, contributing to the global energy crisis that began since the Gulf War. Saudi Arabian and American forces begin conducting a huge counterinsurgency operation against the AJF in the Arabian Peninsula. Hundreds of thousands of American troops establish a plethora of bases throughout the country. In 1994, a huge wave of protests sweep through Saudi Arabia, initially focused on labor rights and the withdrawal of foreign troops, but quickly escalated to demands for a complete overhaul of the political system. AJF activists lead the charge, leveraging grassroots support and widespread dissatisfaction. Pro-monarchy forces react harshly, firing at protesters in several cities. By March, armed insurrections break out in almost all of Saudi Arabia's major cities, including the capital, Riyadh. U.S. casualties mount as American forces attempt to fight the insurgents. However, the costliness of the Gulf War, coupled with the looming threat of another guerrilla war so soon after Vietnam, leads to huge anti-war protests in the U.S. The Battle of Riyadh proves to be a turning point, where hundreds of American soldiers are killed as AJF militants storm the U.S. Embassy, taking the entire embassy staff hostage. President Clinton negotiates with the AJF, agreeing to withdraw all coalition forces from the country if the AJF agreed to release the American hostages. Following the American troop withdrawal, the AJF easily topples the Saudi monarchy, establishing the Islamic Socialist Republic of Arabia. North and South Yemen then also unite under a communist government. Iraq takes advantage of the crisis to again invade Kuwait. This time, the US does nothing, signaling the weakening of America's superpower status. These Middle Eastern communist regimes immediately moved to expel Western personnel and nationalize their oil industries, causing a sharp and immediate drop in oil exports as production halts amid the turmoil. The violence and uncertainty lead European countries to scramble for alternative energy sources, triggering an energy crisis due to the sudden cutoff in Middle Eastern oil. At the same time, Sarov orders the Eastern Bloc to limit the sale of oil to Western European countries. By 1995, the energy crisis has pushed much of the Western world into a severe economic depression. However, the global economic crisis has a much stronger impact in Latin America. By 1988, Soviet agents had succeeded in forming a coalition of leftist militias in Mexico, known as the People's Revolutionary Front, better known by its Spanish acronym, the FRP. By 1991, the FRP has begun a campaign of targeted sabotage against government and corporate interests, calling for a national uprising. In 1994, the FRP escalates the war, taking advantage of nationwide strikes and protests to capture several towns in southern Mexico. By 1995, the severe economic downturn that has gripped the world only intensifies the revolt in Mexico, pushing many working class, indigenous, and rural Mexicans to support the FRP. In March of that year, FRP militias launch a stunning attack on Mexico City. Aided by defected portions of the military, they swiftly capture much of the Mexican governing administration, including the president, effectively overthrowing the government. The FRP then proclaims the establishment of the Mexican Socialist Republic or MSR for short. The United States then heavily sanctions the MSR and builds up hundreds of thousands of troops along the Mexican border for Operation Liberty Shield, with a mission of restoring the previous Mexican government. U.S. forces blitz through northern Mexico and easily capture Veracruz via an amphibious assault. By 1997, American forces capture Mexico City, putting the United States in control over most Mexican cities. However, the remnants of the MSR, backed by the Soviet Union, Cuba, and other anti-American groups in Latin America, 
initiate a huge guerrilla war against the invaders. Tens of thousands of people die in the ensuing Mexican insurgency. This triggers a wave of support for socialism and disdain for the United States across Latin America. Brazil sees the election of a socialist government headed by Lula, while leftist revolutions in Chile, Colombia, and Argentina overthrow their national governments. Venezuela, Ecuador, and Peru soon see the formation of socialist governments through both elections and workers' uprisings. In 1998, Sarov takes advantage of all this by inviting Latin American socialist leaders to a summit in Moscow. Here, the socialist leaders agree to form the Latin American Socialist Alliance, or LASA, effectively a Warsaw Pact for Latin America. LASA member states agree to pledge as much support to the MSR as necessary for as long as it takes to defeat the United States. The United States intensifies its counterinsurgency operations in Mexico and targeted assassinations across Latin America, earning it even more enmity from the global community. Huge anti-war protests and labor strikes paralyzed the U.S. through 1999, shutting down much of the country. Anti-American protests in Europe bolster left-wing politicians in Western European countries. All of this only exacerbates the global economic crisis, causing left-wing politicians across the West to surge in support. By the end of 1999, techno-scientific Marxists have won enough seats in the West German Bundestag to push a reunification with the East. The Berlin Wall comes down and East and West Germany unify into a semi-democratic federal state that is neither part of NATO or the Warsaw Pact. However, Germany's techno-scientific Marxist slint means the country still leans slightly towards the communist world. Meanwhile, in 2000, the Soviet Union and China hold a summit in the Mongolian capital of Ulaanbaatar, where they agree to put aside their past differences and renew their alliance. In 2001, the U.S. accepts defeat in the war in Mexico and withdraws its forces from the country allowing the socialists to swiftly regain control. However, the damage to America's reputation has already been done. Throughout the 2000s, politicians espousing techno-scientific Marxism rise to power throughout Western Europe. To further support the newly elected techno-scientific Marxists in Western Europe, Sarov begins selling them oil at a reduced rate, ordering the Middle Eastern communist regimes to do the same. The French Socialist Party takes full control over France's government in a series of democratic elections and fully withdraws France from NATO. After a major economic crisis in 2008, techno-scientific Marxists also win full control over Italy and Britain's governments, and subsequently withdraw from NATO. The 2010s now sees the United States globally isolated and economically weakened. Bernie Sanders, bolstered by the Democratic Socialists of America, gains widespread popularity during the 2016 presidential primaries by advocating for techno-scientific Marxism. Sanders still loses the primary to Clinton, who still loses the general election to Trump, who capitalizes on an even stronger anti-establishment, nationalist, and economically protectionist movement within the Republican Party. With the Cold War almost entirely lost by this point, Trump withdraws America from most of its remaining overseas commitments, completely disbanding NATO. American forces also completely leave South Korea and Japan. Sarov capitalizes on this by ordering communist governments around the world to sweep away the last vestiges of capitalism. The Soviet Union, North Korea, and China all initiate a huge invasion of South Korea in 2018, beginning the Second Korean War. Trump sends aid to South Korea, but does not directly deploy troops. Japan attempts to swiftly remilitarize, but cannot do enough to save South Korea. However, the revitalized Japanese armed forces prove to be enough of a threat to deter a full-on communist invasion of the Japanese mainland. By 2020, the communists have emerged victorious in the Second Korean War, placing South Korea under the rule of the autocratic North Korean government. China invades Taiwan the same year, leading to a huge war with Japan and triggering a global semiconductor crisis and pushing the United States into further economic calamity. This, coupled with the ongoing global pandemic, allows Sanders to secure the Democratic nomination in 2020. Sanders and other techno-scientific Marxists then sweep the 2020 elections. These politicians not only advocate for techno-scientific Marxism, but also espouse isolationism similar to Trump, arguing that wild anti-communist intervention in the past few decades has only brought economic disaster to America. President Sanders pursues detente with the Soviet Union, allowing the USSR to take its place as the world's sole superpower. With the United States now under the control of an isolationist, techno-scientific Marxist government, NATO no longer existing, and most countries in Europe, Latin America, the Middle East, and Asia now communist, it is clear that the USSR has won the Cold War. Most of the world is now condemned to living in dystopian conditions under the control of repressive, authoritarian communist states that follow the economic principles of techno-scientific Marxism. Grigory Petrovich Sarov, still alive and serving as the absolute ruler of the Soviet Union, goes down as the USSR's greatest leader. In 2024, now aged 96, Sarov passes away, having ruled the Soviet Union for 40 years.